Well, thank you, Kelly, and uh, thank you, everybody. It's a, a great pleasure for me to be here today, and I want to thank Kale and Johan and uh, all of the other members of this fantastic new centre for um, asking me to be part of the board and part of it. I appreciate it very much. It's terrific. Um, I won't delay any more with any... Uh, uh, <laughs> with... with <laughs> introductions, so I'll get straight into it. And um, I've used evolution in two ways in this talk. One, to, to talk, talk about uh, where is the state of resilient science now? How has it got to where it is, and where does it need to go? And then secondly, the particular issue of, of the perspective of social ecological systems as, as evolutionary systems versus, and I put this in inverted commas, a resilience equilibrium perception, and I'll come back to that. I think it's something we need to address. So part one is to do with where research is at. And if you notice my subtitle, this is my first quad of three quads of points that I want to make. And this first one then is that there are four basic tenets of Brazilian's theory. And that they are that social ecological systems are self-organizing systems with centripetal dynamics. That is, they tend towards some kind of an attractor. The second is that they have multiple stability domains. There are limits to change before they start self-organizing towards some other attractor. Thirdly, the changes through time reflect a passage of some sort through different phases of what is called an adaptive cycle. And fourthly, they function at multiple scales. And the cross-scale effects, as Kali has pointed out several times today, are really critical, the whole idea of panicky. So those are the four. And the first two of those tenets puts a very strong emphasis on regime shifts on thresholds between alternate stable states. And if you think about it, if for whatever you're interested in, the stock, stock of state capital or a fast variable of a system that, that's your variable of concern, in relation to the underlying slow variables that control it, there are four basic relationships that they can exhibit. Um, this is kind of linear or curvilinear, but it's, there's no break in it. There's no discontinuity in it. And, and a lot of people make that as a basic assumption of most relationships that occur in, in ecosystems, at least. You can have a stepwise function. There are no feedback changes in this, but it, it's the difference between two states very sharply as you go from one small change in the slow variable. These are the two that are of most interest in resilience theory, where you have alternate stable states. Remember, these are the stable amounts of this variable for a given amount of the underlying variable. So this, these are the equilibrium values we're talking about. And between these two levels, across that range of the underlying variable, there are two stable states separated by an unstable equilibrium. This is the extreme version of that. This is an irreversible shift. And this is just a reversible one. And that this hysteresis effect is very important. And it simply means that in this zone, if the system is there, it will tend towards that stable state. And if the system is just there, it will tend towards that one. That might be considered as a kind of peculiar result. And it used to be when people started to work on this. The Resilience Alliance has now got a thresholds database in which, which has over 100 examples of published accounts of this kind of behavior in different kinds of systems. So it's actually not a rarity, it's very common. And of course this is a well-known paper by Martin Schaeffer and, and a bunch of others. And uh, what it shows is again the same behavior of the multiple stable state, but the nice point about this is to introduce the notion of a basin of attraction when you're in this part of the slow variable condition of the system there is a single stable point to the system and no matter where you are it will tend towards that point when you're up at that level it will tend towards that point and as you go along and as you change the slow variable so you go into a multiple stability domain and eventually all you need is a perturbation across there, which is the same part as that arrow, and it'll go into this one. Eventually, you only have that one. That, the shift of that point, so that as this basin gets smaller over time, this basin gets bigger. 
That's a very important outcome. Okay, now why is it important? Well, if we cast it this way and we think that this again is the supply of ecosystem services that you're interested in, and this is some slow controlling variable again. And I've used two well-known examples, a lake services, these in the blue one, which is sort of clear water and plenty of fish, is what you're interested in. And in a rangeland, it would be grassland with lots of livestock production. In each case, these two systems have a threshold point along the slow variable. In the lake case, it's the amount of mud, in the phosphorus in the bottom of the lake in mud. And in the rangeland, it's the amount of shrubby vegetation. And as they pass a critical threshold, the dynamics of the system change. It goes from one regime of the system to another regime. And the important thing is that although you wouldn't really detect it because this seems to be going slowly down, immediately you've crossed that critical threshold, the dynamics differ. They now go this way. If you're on that side, they go that way. And that's the important thing, is that you, if you don't know about that, and this threshold itself might shift. So you might be sitting there and thinking everything's okay, because it's still tending that way, but if the threshold moved to there, which it can do through changes in conditions, then the system will track that way. Now the difference between a resilience approach to thinking about managing a system like that and an optimization multiple maximum yield approach would be if you were looking at a, at a maximum sustainable yield, for the lake, you would try and put the system there because that's the highest point. And for a rangeland, you might try and put it there. For the lake, you'd be sitting very dangerously close to a threshold and you could get knocked across it or the threshold could move. But that's what maximum sustainable yield tries to do. A resilience approach would say it is far preferable to be anywhere there than anywhere there. So don't try and find where the peak is. Try and find where the threshold is and learn to stay away from it. Because anywhere there is infinitely better than anywhere there. It's a different way of thinking about how you would be trying to manage and use a system. Okay, the second two tenets, this is still where we are, has to do with changes in system dynamics and the notion of adaptive cycles. This is the Roman Forum on a wet day, Sunday, that I was there. And it's a fantastic place to go and see what a civilization can achieve. This was the center of Rome, obviously. Just as one example, if you look around in there, you, you can find this Cloaca Maxima, which is an amazing uh, deep down um, drainage system built over 2,000 years ago that still works. And uh, Joe Tainter told me to go and have a look at this, and he also told me to go about a, nearly a kilometer away, and I found this is an old, old church. And this church sits on top of a buried other church, which sits on top of an old Roman worshipping place. And, uh, if, and I've excavated the lot, and you can go right down into this, and in the very corner, there's an old grid. And you can actually hear the water from the Cloaca Maxima still running underneath there. So when you think, well, how did that system, because it was incredible to have built all of that, what happened? Well, this is Lake Balaton, and this is a, a medieval castle that was built on top of a Roman church. And, and this is Joe Tainter, who, um, <laughs> and I, I was carrying his notebook for him on this day as a, learning how to do archaeology and stuff with him. But Joe's ideas of why, how this happened are very interesting. And this is one of the bits of information he gives that I think is fantastic. This is around about the year of Christ, and this is how much silver there was in Roman coinage. There are thousands of coins all over the world, and they're all dated, so you can work it out quite well. And this is about 100% silver, solid silver. And if you look at what happened to the amount of silver in Roman coins, it goes right down to zero, and at about this point, at about 230 AD or something, Rome would not accept taxes in its own currency anymore. And people had to pay in other kinds with, for very good reason. They knew what it was worth. And, uh, and at that point, Rome collapsed. So I hope Joe would forgive this short summary, but if you've ever read his book, it's a very interesting book on the...